you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Hey, peeps. Tamara here. As you know, our goal with Inside Launchery Podcast is to bring you the insights and actions that you need so that you can tap the power of innovation to be a high-performing, high-power leader in whatever you do. And that's both individually and in the teams that you lead. Now, speaking of teams, have you ever wondered why some teams just gel? Everyone seems to be on the same page, moving forward together. It's almost like they're being pulled by an invisible force. And then other teams, they just seem to to not have anything. It's like lackluster. They're scattered all different directions, maybe even pulling each other down. Well, that was my question too, and why I invited today's guest onto the show. So drawing on over 13 years of experience working with companies including Keurig, Hewlett Packard, Johnson & Johnson, Whirlpool, Toyota, et cetera, Catherine Radica provides time-tested insights into the kind of corporate culture infrastructure, and strategy necessary to strengthen existing innovation teams with the aim of closing knowledge gaps faster and optimizing product innovation programs. Sounds good, right? Well, she has a new book that we dig into, High Velocity Innovation, How to Get Your Best Ideas to Market Faster. And she is the executive director of the Rapid Learning Cycles Institute, where they lay out best practices and methods to help business leaders remove barriers to innovation and get their best ideas to market faster. We're going to dig into a really interesting conversation. But hey, really quickly before we do that, if you are getting a ton of value out of my podcast, which I'm assuming you are because you keep coming back, I hope you are, do me a favor, share with a friend that needs a little innovation in their lives. Just copy and paste it, text it over and just like, hey, I think you'll get a lot out of this podcast. I'd so appreciate it. All right, let's dig into the conversation with Catherine. Catherine, thank you so much for joining me today. We have so much to discuss. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right, since we're just getting to know each other, what's the one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? Um, Well, I don't look particularly athletic, but I actually love long distance walking. And so I I have done a lot of walking on some of the classic trails like the Pacific Crest Trail in the United States. And this summer um, in May of 2020, I'm going to be walking St. Cuthbert's Way, which is an ancient pilgrimage route that starts in Melrose in Scotland and ends up on an island off the coast of Scotland. It's about 60 miles. We'll do that over about 10 days. Um, And I just love the... um, the, the, t- the fact that those long distance walks and all the train training I do for that and how that gives me a kind of a natural time to kind of meditate and reflect on how things are going on in my life and in the world. You are speaking my language. So I have to tell you that one of my, I'm sitting here smiling because one of my dreams is to do the El Camino in Spain. Okay. That's or, also like, one of my, one of my goals yeah, <laughs> is to like, do the El Camino in Spain or at all least the way. a portion of it, <laughs> but I would, I mean, it's so long, right? Mm-hmm. It's so long, but there's a lot of places that will allow you to do just the last 100 kilometers. And there's so much support on the last 100 kilometers that you can, you know, you can do it as an easy walk in really short segments, um, you know, or you can do it as a more, um, more vigorous walk over a shorter period of time. But, you know, if you, if that's, if, you know, it's your dream to do the Camino, you should do it. I do want to do it. I think I'm going to do it. Um, okay. and, but I, I kind of want to know how this other one in Scotland goes because 60 miles isn't so bad. So I yeah, like, I'm, well, yeah. it is, it's a long way. I'm not saying that, but so I wanted to, so, oh my gosh. Okay. That's a whole different podcast. I have many questions about the long distance walking because that's fascinating okay. to me. And like I said, I have all these trails I really want to do. Um, so, but here's my question for you on that. You mentioned very quickly as you were talking about it, that it gives you a chance to be a little bit reflective, kind of think about what's happened, what's not happened. Um, how do you, you, I'm, I'm just curious how you use that time to to think about all those things. Okay. So, uh, while walking, you know, uh, you know, I, I do the training mostly alone. Um, I do it on trails that I know very well in my part of the country that are safe to, to walk alone. But I am, you know, because of that, it's a very solitary experience. And I find that for me as a busy person, um, and as a person that is, um, 
you know, working with all of these different companies from all around the world, that that time really allows me to knit together the threads that I'm seeing. And, you know, so um, with uh, high velocity innovation, with, uh, um, you know, uh, to pull together what's common across the experiences of all the different companies that I've worked with in order to figure out what, where the common threads are that might be valuable to more than just them, um, but, to, uh, you know, but to others um, that are facing similar challenges. I feel like right now, because you know how it is, the end of the year, it's this big crunch to, as you know, when we're talking, it's uh, just before the Christmas break. And mm-hmm. I, and it seems like everybody wants something. They're trying to kind of get all the boxes checked before the holiday, which makes sense. But I was just saying to my teammate, um, I feel like I'm so busy kind of working on all these things that I just don't have a chance to connect all these dots that I'm seeing. And I need this break to get back to that place because I just can't do it on the day to day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I'm really fond of a couple of quotes. Um, one is a quote from Flannery O'Connor, who says that she never knows when the angel of inspiration is going to show up, but she knows that she's going to be at her desk between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. every day, just in case. <laughs> and That's great. So, and then the, the other one is uh, a, a, a person who said, you know, when I'm, uh, you know, ordinarily I pray once for an hour, but when I'm really busy, I pray for two hours. Mm-hmm. And what, you know, and I think that what... Um, what, what those things both kind of speak to me is the fact that when you're working on something that's so intensely mental, like innovation, um, yeah. all, the, all the work associated with innovation, it is so helpful to develop a personal practice of finding that quiet space to just allow, to just sit with everything that's happening and just allow yourself some time to just kind of sift through it all. And that that you know, like I said, it helps you identify the patterns. It helps you figure out what to do in the moment. Um, I know that my clients don't realize it often, but they've definitely benefited from the time that I've spent in the morning, you know, with my coffee, just in silence, just getting ready for my day with them and thinking about what I'm going to say and do that day with them. That's going to help move them forward in a way that, that that's going to be the most helpful for them. Yeah. I think oftentimes it's in those moments that don't look like work that we actually get the, Mm -hmm. we do the best work actually. And so you mentioned it a few times with innovation and that is your area of expertise. So let's, let's dig into that. Because in some ways, what you and I were talking about when we discovered your long walks is how to get over some of the barriers of innovation, too. So you're Mm -hmm. the executive director of the Rapid Learning Cycles Institute, and you have a very long career of working with top brands. What have you encountered as some of the biggest barriers to innovation? I'd love to start there because that's the thing that we all have in the back of our head or those things that stop us. So I I would say that probably the biggest barrier to innovation that I see inside um, any company really that's past the startup phase is that there's not a lot of pull for innovation. Um, Now, pull is kind of a difficult concept to explain, um, but I can actually use the Camino to do that. So one, I have not walked the Camino myself, but I have heard from people walking it that once you get started, it's like there's a force that's pulling you towards Santiago at the end of the pilgrimage. All the arrows are pointed in one direction. Everybody that you encounter is walking the same direction that you are. You know, all of the, you know, everything from the the way that you eat your meals in the restaurants to, you know, what happens at the end of a day when you get to a new town, you know, everything is kind of getting used to um, get up the next morning and get right back on that trail and start heading towards Santiago. We need to create the same sort of experience for our innovation teams where everything that's surrounding them is driving them towards the kind of innovation that we most need as a company. And that means that, first of all, we have to figure out what that means for ourselves. You know, for my company, what is the kind of innovation that I need? You know, where do I, where do we really need to be pushing the boundaries of what we can do? For a technology company that might be around, where are the specific areas where we're pushing the boundaries of the technology? You know, for a company that's more service oriented, it might be more around, how do we really get into the needs of our customers and figure out how to fulfill those needs in more innovative ways. Uh, you know, for a bank, you know, um, how can we really get inside the heads of our customers around their finances and really develop products and services? They're going to make it easier uh, for them to achieve their financial goals, for example. And so whatever that is, you know, creating that sense of alignment around we're all heading the same direction um, towards the, towards the right kind of innovation is going to make it easier for the creative ways to fulfill that need 
to emerge. Because if I don't know, if you just tell me to be innovative, but I don't know what you're looking for, I'm going to come up with a lot of really interesting stuff. But is it really going to meet that, you know, you know, if I bring that to you and I say, well, this is the kind of innovation I think we should have, you know, what's your reaction going to be to that? You're not even going to know how to react because you're not going to know yourself whether or not this innovation is in alignment with the direction we want to take the company. So it starts with what I call a strategic imperative for innovation, which is this is why our company needs innovation. And, and for that not to be just communicated to the handful of people that you might call innovation people, but for that to be communicated to the entire company so that everyone has that sense of alignment around the need for innovation. So why is it so hard or so challenging, maybe is a better way to say it, for, for leadership to figure out that strategic imperative as you put it? I think oftentimes, to your point, there's this mandate to innovate, but it's not clearly defined. There's no Santiago, right? There's no clear direction that we're all headed. So that's part number one. And I think the second layer to that is if that's figured out, then where is the challenges? And I've seen this you know, all too often, I'm sure you have too, in communicating that out in a way that gets people to all walk in that direction. Yeah. So, um, so I think the first question is that um, I think it's sometimes hard for leaders that have gotten a little bit disconnected from what's happening down at the lower levels of the organization to even understand what's possible. And so it's very hard for them to articulate a strategic imperative that's going to resonate with people that they really don't know very well. All right. And um, when I think of a company that does it well, the company that I featured in my book, Gallagher, um, Gallagher is run by, um, I think the company is in its second generation, um, a, a guy, Sir William Gallagher. And he has, his father founded the organization. And, um, you know, and it's for, it's in New Zealand. So it's not, you know, it's not big by U.S. standards, but by New Zealand standards, it's a pretty big company. It's got a massive complex um, in a place called Hamilton. Um, and, you know, it would be really easy for, you know, Sir William to get really distant from, you know, what's happening on the ground with his innovation teams. But um, the leadership that he's put in place there um, have a really you know, are kind of really encouraged to stay really connected to the work that's going on at the ground. And I think that helps them understand when we say we need innovation, we need it in this particular space. Um, you know, we have knowledge in, um, and, and they have done this. In fact, they had a lot of knowledge about electrified fencing that for agriculture, because that's what they did. All right. Well, you know, there are other places where electrified fencing is important. Um, and, and so uh, developing security products for, you know, things like military install installations and, and places like that, that need to be highly secure, developing uh, electrified products for that market, leveraging what they knew. Okay. So that requires them, first of all, to understand what they know, and then to be looking and you know, out and saying, well, where else could we use this? What else could we do, right? Mm -hmm. The second thing that Gallagher does really well is they tell stories about this stuff. They have the, the, starting with the founding story of the company itself, which is that this guy, Bill Gallagher, a farmer in, you know, middle of New Zealand, um, had a truck and he had a horse and the horse kept bumping his truck, just like decided he liked to bump and rub, kind of rub against <laughs> the truck and you know it's not good for the truck no, <laughs> and so he life. figured out yeah exactly so he figured out how to wire a little circuit uh, from the battery of the truck that would you know give a little shock to the horse when the horse rubbed against the truck and you know you do that a couple times and then the horse isn't rubbing against the truck anymore and you know and so um and then you know the entire concept of electrified fencing came out of that you know that you know, Bill Gallagher and his truck. And they tell that story. It's not just that they have that story. It's that they tell that story. Everybody at Gallagher knows that story. And, and, and then they have this, um, this, this thing for relentless innovation and they point back to that and they say, you know, we are about relentless innovation. Uh, you know, we have this story, we have this story of, you know, of how they grew their electrified fencing out of agriculture. They have the stories of how they've have taken some other things that they've learned a, a about uh, fluid dynamics and turned that into, you know, flow meters for a variety of applications. So they have these stories that they've told about how they've been able to take their company from this one little guy, you know, in his truck, you know, to this, this giant for a New Zealand company, um, you know, by you know, by focusing on this relentless innovation and by never being satisfied with what they've, they've delivered. And, and so it just makes it so that everybody in the organization knows that this is what they are 
about. Um, and, and that that really helps. And I have another example from a different company, SunPower. You know, SunPower, the people who work at SunPower are on a mission because solar energy is a huge part of the solution to climate change. And they all know that and they are on a mission about that. So how, you know, so SunPower, when they were developing their new, um, their newest, um, uh, they just released a major platform for solar technology that's much more efficient than the previous solutions. And everybody working on that, um, you know, understood the urgency understood the value to the company and also the value to the planet. And, you know, and again, I think that that alignment really creates a tremendous amount of pull. And this is a very complicated product. There were new factories, new, uh, new physics behind the, the interior of the cell itself. There were uh, um, figuring out new models of distribution for uh, solar energy, um, how to get solar energy into more places and figuring out how all of that worked. But, you know, again, that sense of mission, you know, really helps drive a lot. Well, what I love about both of those examples, Catherine, is that it's really the, also the power of making it personal and sharing stories. I think oftentimes we think mm -hmm. that communicating goals, objectives, beautiful Excel spreadsheets, like that's going to do it or PowerPoint. But what you're saying yeah. isn't just, hey, this is where we're headed kind of financially and all that's all important. But also, here's the story and the why and the reason and the connection of, of why. We, and one of them's a mission. One of them's kind of an origin story. but both of them are, are personal. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that when I talk about poll, I think that one of the things that the companies have done that I feature in my book is that they have made this personal. So another example, so Trimax Mowers is a tiny, tiny company in a place called Taranga, which is on the, um, on the North Island of New Zealand. And when I met them, they had three engineers. I mean, that's how small they were. And um, they came to one of my workshops and um, and by the time they left my workshop, they had decided to reset their entire um, innovation program, which consisted of a, of a very small number of things. It wasn't like a massive thing. Um, but they, but they, had decided to do it. They, had, they had decided to jump in, yeah. you know, to jump all in with rapid learning cycles to get, get going. Okay, so what's, one of the things that's motivating them is they're a really small company competing against some very big players. I mean, this, this tiny company competes against John Deere and Toro and, um, you know, and all of the other kind of big ag tech players. And, and, you know, they've got a couple of products that are niche products, but that are excellent products in their market. And, you know, and their goal is to be the David against the Goliath, right? And um, to kind of, you know, from this place that's kind of out of the way and nobody's really ever heard of it to, um, you know, to compete in, you know, the, the West Coast, you know, um, you know, all of the West Coast agricultural uh, work that's going on, you know, that's, that's a big market for them. And so, you know, it's like, you know, again, there, that sense of like, you know, we're these small kind of scrappy people and we're going to go up against these big guys and we're going to take them on because we're going to be able to do stuff that they can't do, um, you know, kind of like is another, another kind of entree to that. So I think that, you know, to kind of boil all this down, um, I think that, you know, if you're, if you're in a position where you're, you're um, giving direction to people around innovation. We want to think about distilling it down and making it um, making it something that people can personally connect to. Um, and whether that is we're saving the world, or whether that is we're helping our patients by developing a new medical device, or whether that's um, around you know we're making our customers' lives easier, um, you know, which is kind of Keurig's thing, you know, whatever it is, you know, to make that as personal as possible for for people that you wouldn't think need that. I mean, this is the thing. Everybody understands that the marketing people need that, but the engineers also need that, yeah. and your manufacturing people, who are the people responsible for managing your, your production, need that, and the people responsible for, um, you know, for your HR need that because they need to be looking for the people that are in alignment with that, and so, um, and so, making sure that 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 strategic imperative for innovation is something that you're cascading all the way down and making personal all the way down is is how you pull a lot of innovation from your teams. And yeah. then the rest of it is how you get there. Yeah. So I have a question about the poll. So I love the concept of the poll. And I think it's so what you're saying and those, those examples really bring it to life and how it impacts the person and the business. When I think oftentimes when we, even when we realize our poll and it's powerful and we've communicated it, um, it it's not necessarily a, a linear path up to success. Like there's this kind of a, as I call the J curve of innovation where it kind of dips down and then it kind of goes back up oftentimes. How do you deal with those resistors and, and the fighting forces of, of the pull that inevitably happen? Like what are some of those that you've seen and how do you deal with those to keep people on the path of the pull? 
Okay. So, um, so one thing that is a universal issue with innovation is that in an established company, the current business is the thing that has urgency and importance. It's right. like everybody is going to focus on getting the orders out to the customers that have already committed. And the innovation stuff is going to, depending on the group or the the person going to be seen as unnecessary or a bother or something that's just getting in the way of my job or, or, um, or whatever. Right. And so, um, and that is where a lot of resistance comes from. And unfortunately the thing that I see that makes me feel, uh, you know, personally, um, you know, kind of sad is when an innovation team has worked really hard on an idea and it's a really good idea, but the business is really resistant to it. And, and, you know, it's like the innovation team is pushing this thing onto this team and they don't want it, they don't yeah. see the need for it, and et cetera, right? And so how I've, um, the strategies that I employ to help a company overcome that, you know, once you've, is first of all, of course, communicating the strategic imperative to all of those resistors to say, no, actually, this is part of your job, you know, because this is the future of the company. And if you want to be part of the future of the company instead of the past, then you need to find a way to embrace this. Um, the second is to, realize that an innovation is an investment decision. And investment decisions, you know, need to be made by the people that have that farsighted view that can recognize that this is the future of the company. We're going to invest X in the future of this company. X meaning the time from our staff, um, X being money uh, that we invest in, in innovation. And then we expect you to spend that money. So I was working with a team in Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago and they had some people up from their manufacturing group in Mexico and typically the manufacturing group would not be involved at all in an innovation program they would just kind of be the recipients of whatever they came was you know they were being told to deliver right and but this time there were some key questions about manufacturability that needed to be addressed early on um, but um, and so they had invited these people to participate now they are very, very busy people. Um, you know, lines go down, supply chain um, uh, connections break, um, and you know, all kinds of things happen. And so, and so, they're they're people that are extremely busy already. But they have for this program a few responsibilities, not a lot, a few um, that they of areas where they need to develop knowledge about manufacturability to inform the engineering team's decisions about materials and things. And so this team is engaged with this innovation program. And I can tell you that um, I know that they all recognize that it's going to be very difficult for them to find the time to do these things, but they've been told you need to spend, oh, about, um, about a half day every other week on this. You know, that's that's the investment that we're choosing to make in understanding these. And, you know, you guys can decide together how you want to do that, but that's the investment that we're expecting you to make in this. So they're expecting them to, you know, um, come to these events where they're going to be expected to produce the results of their investigations. And, you know, and, and the man, one of the things the manager is looking for is are they – indeed spending the time that that we have chosen to invest in this of their time uh, are they indeed spending that time and um which will be obvious in the work that they produce right and then if they don't it's not on them it's on their manager okay you know you we we told you we really needed you know a half a day of these people's time every other week and I know you guys are busy and the current business is always going to be more important to you, but we really need them to spend that time, you know, so holding the managers accountable for their people having the time. But then here's what happens is they're engaged in this program. Now that program is a little bit of them. They have a little bit of themselves in that program. When that program comes and it's going to have some serious manufacturing challenges when it arrives, it's going to be a difficult one for them. They're not going to be like, Oh my gosh, look at what the engineering teams have done to us now. Oh, how horrible this is. Why are we doing this? Why can't we just do things the old way? They're going to be like, no, this is, you know, this is going to be partly their baby too, right? And so there's this pull across the organizational boundaries by having that involvement. And it is not necessarily a significant investment. It's actually a very small percentage of their time. It's less than 10%. But for the, you know, the easing, the flow into manufacturability, into manufacturing for this product where they know manufacturability is going to be a challenge, they have established a road for that. You know, they've cleared a way for, um, for that product to move into manufacturing, um, you know, in a situation where normally it would be much more difficult. You know, I, I think um, 
I think the key in there that I just want to make sure we on Launch Street really pay attention to is getting the people who have to do the work involved mm-hmm. in the innovation up front. And yes. I think oftentimes that's the biggest mistake that we make is whether that's as leaders we make the decisions or, you know, and I'm not a fan of innovation teams that are siloed and do, I think an innovation team should be an enabler of innovation and not a, you know, behind the black curtain doer. I think mm-hmm. to be accountable, but everybody has to be responsible. But in what you're saying, the beauty of that is that we bring other other people in and it's not to say they're in the tw- trenches 24 7 but they have a say so that when it's time to do it to your point it they created part of it or they had a say in part of it and I think oftentimes mm-hmm. innovation becomes this one-way tennis match and the other person's on the other side like ducking and weaving yeah because, exactly like what is this and where does yeah, this come like, from I, well, and all they uh, say you know, is more work like oh yeah. that's more work or a change in how I do things or you know the resistors just your personal resistors fly up because you had nothing to do with the decision. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then the other thing that happens then is that, you know, I, I they are going to be part of the events where the team's, you know, preliminary thoughts about their design and things are going to be brought up. And so if there's any other manufacturability issues that the team doesn't know that they don't know about, yeah. right, those are going to be highlighted because you've got somebody in the room representing that to say, oh, that's not going to be as easy as you think it's going to be. <laughs> you know, right. we're going to need to, we should, we should do some learning about that too. You know? Um, so yeah. So we're really kind of setting up a team for, um, you know, uh, setting up, setting up an innovation for, um, for much easier adoption. And then the resistance just kind of, you know, there are always going to be people that just want nothing sure. to do with anything new, but, but there are, you know, um, but I don't think that's most people. I think for most people, the resistance really comes more from the fact that someone shows up on their doorstep with something they haven't heard about, they haven't been involved in, they can see all the problems with it immediately, they haven't had a chance to raise those problems with anybody, and so the problems are still there when they get there, which is very late. And, you know, and then they're like, what are you doing this to me for? Right, totally. You know, yeah. I, was, I had spent years in new product development, and it always made me laugh I don't know if laughs is the right word, but roll my eyes maybe, that in market research, we would constantly go out and talk to the customer and get their feedback all along the way of a development of an idea, but internal in a company, we didn't do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. there it was a mandate, but with a, which, and ultimately it's the same thing. You're making a change, you're doing something new, you're improving something. It's no different than an innovation you take to market. It just might not be look as a product or service, but that always made me laugh a little bit because we're doing it right over more or less right over here and we don't do it at all over here. I want to switch gears for a second and talk about velocity because um, I think that's a big part of innovation, something that you highlight. In fact, it's the title of your book, High Velocity Innovation. So this may sound like a naive question, but I want to use it as a springboard. Why is velocity important to innovation? Okay. So, um, Velocity is important because every innovation operates in a dynamic environment where things are changing. And if you have an idea and you can bring that idea to market quickly, you can bring it to market. Um, the, the need that you recognized that, that led to this idea is much more likely to still be there. Um, you're much less likely to have competitors that have gotten there ahead of you. And so, um, in, in all of the investment that you've made in innovation, you're going to start realizing return on that investment a lot faster. And so, um, and so speed in, um, in innovation, um, you know, allows you to take advantage of windows of opportunity that may not be open for very long. Um, and, and, and to capitalize on those faster than everyone else who's trying to get to the same place. Um, so it, Um, you know, and then, um, the thing about speed is that when a team is able to move quickly through the innovation process, then, um, you know, a a lot of, of the other kinds of organizational churn things just become not as much of an issue as well, such as new leadership changes or new strategic direction changes or all the things that can happen to an organization, to an innovation when it takes too long. Um, and so when you can, it just makes it easier because you're working in a dynamic situation, but it hasn't had as much time to change. So talk to me a little bit about, so your Institute's rapid learning cycles, and I know it has its roots in agile, which a lot of us know about, but talk to me, because I think this is where velocity becomes real and tangible. Talk to me a little bit about your framework and how that works with your clients. 
Okay, so um, so the Rapid Learning Cycles framework is an adaptation of Agile for products that have high cost of change. So the thing about, and, and the thing is you want to be, everybody wants to be Agile. By that I mean everybody wants to be right. flexible, responsive, adaptive, nimble. Yep. able, nimble. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you're making something like a toaster or a, um, you know, or a new medical device, the things that you need to do to achieve that nimbleness is not what a software team needs to do if they're developing the latest app. Okay, because, and the key difference there is that if I'm developing a new medical device that's got to get FDA approval or if I'm developing a new toaster and I've got to have millions of them on the shelf at Walmart by November 1st um, in order to hit Black Friday, then... I'm operating in a very different environment. Yeah. The decisions that I make about the design are decisions I'm going to be living with, right, once I turn the crank on, on production. And um, in the app world, of course, if I make a mistake, I just fix it. You know, it's yeah, like hopefully right. I haven't I done anything some code and I'm done. I just changed them. Exactly, exactly. And so it's not zero. Cost of change is not, not driven all the way to nothing, but it's not very high compared to what it is yeah. if I have to recall a million toasters, right? And so for that reason, um, a lot of the assumptions of Agile software development don't apply to that you know, tangible product space. And so um, what the framework has done is said, okay, well, let's look at what does apply. Let's go back down to the roots of Agile and look at what's going on there and think about why it's working and then pull in the things from that framework that we can also use to help make, make innovation more efficient in this, in this high cost of change space. But, and then let's, um, and, and, and the key things around that are the fact that you have a regular established period of work. In the software world, they might call that a sprint. Um, we call that a learning cycle because that's what we're doing in that cycle is we're learning. Um, and, um, and then we close that with an event. Uh, we call it a pull event. And as I was talking about with those manufacturing people, they're going to have to come to their learning cycle event and they're going to have to report on the work that they've done to help um, to build knowledge about this product. And, um, and that's going to pull them to get the work done. The fact that they have to stand up in front of their peers and here's what I've, here's what I've done. Um, and if they are not able to do it because something's in the way, the manager is going to know that immediately. The program leader is going to see it because they're going to see it in the work that they're doing. And so, um, and so we have these events and the, the events also help pull the team through. They help pull work through the system. Now, one of the key differences though, is that if I'm in the software space, the the most important thing I should be doing is writing code. Not all the code is going to be good code. Some of it, I'm going to, I'm going to design a user interface, for example, and then the user is going to do something completely unexpected with it because it, you know, they're going to take it a completely different direction than I thought they would. Okay, fine. I just fix it, right? But the way that I fix it is by writing more code. Now, okay, in the if I'm making a tangible product, say, and I'm looking to do additive manufacturing for the first time, like like production 3D printing, right? Then I've got to learn about that 3D printed material. I've got to learn how that material differs from a cast material um, or a molded material. I've got to learn about um, how um, that additive manufacturing process integrates with the other steps in the manufacturing for this product. You know, so I've got a lot of knowledge that I need to build to help me make a good decision about whether and how to integrate additive manufacturing um, into the manufacturing process for this part that is going to um, require me to run a lot of experiments that may look nothing like the final product, right? So I might just make a bunch of hockey pucks with my new um, fancy new 3D printer and then test those hockey pucks to see how well, you know, where they break, you know, how they react to different kinds of stress, how they react to heat, how they react to cold, you know, um, and it, to help me understand how that material differs from the material that I get when I produce it, the part in a different way. And so, and so that's what's happening inside these learning cycles is like, like instead of writing a bunch of code, we're doing a bunch of things to build knowledge. When you're doing your learning cycles, is what you learn in one cycle then dictate or determine what happens in the next cycle? It, it does to some degree. And, and this is another key difference with Agile, uh, with pure Agile software development, is that one of the things that's key when you're making a product where your decisions have to stick is that you need to know when decisions need to be made. Mm -hmm. And they usually, we want to delay those decisions as long as possible because we know that once we make them, they're going to be hard to unmake. And so um, we want to 
delay that decision. So then what we do, and I, we talk, when I tell my clients, we're going we're gonna to pull our learning forward. We're going to try to learn as early as we can. We're going to push decisions later. We're going to move them as late as they can. Now, most companies you know, kind of get the pull learning forward. That makes sense. The push decisions later is a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because mm-hmm. we think that if we're making decisions, we're doing something. But let me give you an example of where that wasn't, wasn't the case. So SunPower, company I mentioned earlier, whole new technology platform for solar technology. Now, one of the things that you would think would be decided very early on about that is how are we going to go to market with this? Who are we going to sell it to? Who's the ultimate customer for this? But here's the thing. The lead times for a new solar technology platform are very long, Um, you know, in the years, you know, in terms of what manufacturing methods we use, what equipment we buy, where we're going to locate the factory because factories take a long time to build, et cetera. The decision about how to go to market is actually something that can be taken relatively late. And in the, the case of the solar industry, this industry is evolving so quickly that the decisions that they made at the same time they were making the decision about where their fab was going to be, um, if they had taken the decision about the marketing stuff at that time, they would have been the wrong decisions. Just because the market around SunPower is evolving so quickly and in some pretty unexpected ways. And so by delaying that decision and saying, you know, we don't need to know that yet. You know, we can figure that out when we get closer and we see where the industry as a whole is going. Um, They're giving themselves the ability to produce the right final product out of this new platform they're building. Um, The technology, you know, when the technology is ready, then they'll be at a place where they'll be able to figure out, okay, this is going to be the optimal product and the, for the optimal customer that's going to help us commercialize this technology. And so, and so that's an example where, you know, delaying the decision allows time for a dynamic situation to settle a little bit more. Um, and then their release and making these decisions closer in time to when the customer will be making decisions about purchasing the product. You know, it's interesting that you say that about the difference between tech and, well, everything else, phys- more or less physical. Um, and I think it's a really important distinction for all of us to pay attention to that, you know, the philosophies behind agile or the the way it works is great but to your point it's drastically different if you're manufacturing something or putting something to market or you know you don't get to just go in and change a comma to a colon to make it different it's not how it works um, but i also wanted to highlight the co- point you made about delaying those decisions actually allows the dynamic marketplace to settle or at least catch up right so you're making you're almost making more real time decisions than yeah, if you that's exactly it, it. That's exactly right. We are making, and I, and I, like, the, I like calling it a real-time decision because it's basically recognizing, yeah. okay, I'm at a point now, um, I'm at a point now where I really do need this decision because this is going to dictate other things that, that need to happen for this product to get out on time. But up until that point, I don't need this decision. Not really. Right. And if I can preserve flexibility, you know, everything that I can do you know, and the more innovative your product is, the more you need this. Anything that you can do to preserve flexibility is going to enable you to, you know, deliver a better product faster. Because the where the teams waste time or where they get bogged down and where they get stuck is when they've made a decision too early um, without the knowledge that they need it. And then they have to go back and unwind it later. And that's what causes products to be too expensive. It's what causes them to be disappointing um, because they are compromised products. Um, you know, it's what causes, you know, uh, products to have late found uh, issues that cause shipment holes and things like that. And so um, by, by understanding um, what decisions have the potential um, you know, we call them key decisions, high impact, high unknown decisions um, by understanding, you know, which, which those key decisions are and then holding off on those decisions as long as possible, then, then we give ourselves the flexibility to respond to a dynamic environment. And by doing that, I mean, if you want to talk about what's the secret to high velocity, well, that's the secret because, um, you know, everybody believes if we make decisions early, we're actually, we're doing stuff. We're, we're making, we're taking action. You know, we're, we're taking control of this thing. Um, and the reality is that if you're, if you're making decisions without allowing time for the knowledge to emerge that you need to make that decision and you don't yet really need to make that decision, then, um, then what you're doing is just setting yourself up for a product that's going to not be the product you wanted it to be. So one of the, one of the things that's kind of 
rattling around in my brain, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that's rattling around in my brain is, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I love the idea of real-time decisions. I, I think that that is so powerful. To your point, you have more knowledge, the marketplace, you're meeting the marketplace where it is versus trying to catch mm-hmm. up or be behind. But mm-hmm. there's, a, there's also a flip side, which is, um, and I've seen, I'm sure you've seen this too, where teams or leaders, individuals will hold off on decisions that are not those key decisions, right? So what ends up happening is that analysis paralysis, like they're overthinking because mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're <sighs> pretending like those decisions matter so much, right? But then it bottlenecks everything. How yeah. do you help the teams determine between um, the key decisions, those ones that should be more real time, and the ones that are just, you're just delaying and you're allowing kind of that analysis to take over? Yeah, yeah. So what we do is we encourage teams to brainstorm their decisions. And brainstorming decisions sounds a little odd, but what happens is that the decisions that they're worried about or the decisions that would tend to be the places where they would get stuck like that are the decisions that tend to emerge because those are top of mind for them, right? So we have them just kind of like, okay, what are all the decisions that are out there that you have to make? And then we have them really kind of, we have them look at it. We actually have to place them on a matrix that says, okay, how important is this to the success of the final product? You know, and some, they're going to be a rage. Some of them are very, very important, and some of them are not so important. And then how much do you know about this decision? Okay, sometimes they're going to know a lot, uh, you know, already because it's based on something they've done before, and sometimes they're not going to know so much, right? So those high-impact, high-unknown decisions are the key decisions. The other things are, you know, they're different kinds of decisions. We just handle them in other ways. And one of the things that we, we only seek to delay the key decisions, we don't seek to delay the others. And, um, and that can really help. And then, um, you know, one of the things that I'm doing as a coach, and one of the things I, I, I teach my program managers who are using rapid learning cycles to do is to really challenge those key decisions and ask people, okay, so tell me what you do. What do you know about this? If you had to make this decision today, what would you do? Um, you know, um, how to really kind of get at those places where, What you're really dealing with is just some discomfort around commitment versus something that really is a vast unknown area. And um, to kind of encourage teams to really find those critical few key decisions that are going to be the ones that will drive the success of the program. And And then the others can be made the way that we always do. You know, which is that we have the people with the best knowledge and we get them, you know, and we have a a time when that decision needs to be made and we have them make that decision. And that also helps reassure leaders that we're not talking about pushing every decision to the last minute. We're talking about pushing key decisions to what we call the last responsible moment, which is the last point in time when they can make this decision without impacting the program schedule or budget or resources. And, um, and so, um, you know, that, that kind of helps as well with this idea um, because the team will be making a lot of other decisions. They're just going to hold off on the, on the really key ones. So for SunPower, how they were going to go to market with this was a key decision. So they held off on that decision. But there was a whole lot of other decisions they didn't hold off on so that, you know, they would be ready with the technology. You know what I think is brilliant about kind of this key decisions and making them more real time and holding off on them. And, and I love the idea of brainstorming decisions, by the way, because that's where I think things get bottlenecked as we start to make everything a key decision or we just use it as a way to hold, hold off making a decision. But what I appreciate truly about what you're saying is I think that it combined both the velocity and the speed that you need, but also with the thoughtfulness um, and I think sometimes what I hear from people when they're trying to do a, a rapid cycle kind of process is that they actually miss the thoughtfulness behind it and then it bites them in the butt a little bit because they're, they're not actually incorporating it in tools that allow them to, to be mindful and thoughtful and make the smartest decisions because they're, they're so focused on the speed side. Yeah, exactly. And so one of the key things that we do then with these key decisions is we ask ourselves, okay, what do we need to know to make this decision with confidence? And then, and then that is the learning that we pull forward. Ah, well, I, what do we need to know to make the decision with confidence about the market? Well, we need to understand where the market's going. We need to, um, we need to keep close tabs on this market as it evolves over the next couple of years while we're getting the rest of the stuff evolved. And, and then kind of assigning responsibility for that um, to people so that when it comes time to make that decision, okay, now we really need to know where we're going to sell this. You've got people that are coming prepared um, to help the team make that decision with the knowledge that they've built up to make that decision. I'm curious in your... 
uh, maybe it's in writing your book or even in the experience you've had. Have there any, have there been any experiences or aha moments that you found surprising? Uh, surprising. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we thought really early on was that there was going to be a natural cadence for innovation. Mm. And by that, I mean, if you, if you look at the software, agile software methods, most of them have, um, some of them prescribe a, a sprint length, you know, um, yes. it, it's, it's not it's as, a very as rigid specific as it time. Yeah. It's very specific time. And we thought we were going to find that very specific time for rapid learning cycles. And then it turned out not to matter. <laughs> and by that, I mean, I have teams that want to move fast and they, they, they turn cycles every two weeks. I have teams that, you know, are um, kind of think of themselves as slower paced and they're running cycles every six weeks and they're both getting great results. And I think it's because, in, in fact, I think they're getting better results because they're choosing the length of the cycle themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they're, you know, this is, you know, um, but what they have all learned how to do is to scale the activities that they do um, to build this knowledge they need to make better decisions. Um, into the learning cycle that they have. So a group that has two week cycles is gonna have more knowledge gaps. They're gonna have, they're gonna be closing them faster. And they're gonna be, uh, but they're gonna be smaller and they're gonna be more broken down. And a group that is working on a more six week cadence is gonna have maybe bigger uh, knowledge gaps that they go into in a little bit more depth. And, um, and the quality of the decision is what we're after here. We're after improving the quality of the decision so that it does not have to be visited later. And um, and, and they're both going to be doing what they need to do to build the knowledge for that to happen. They're just doing it, you know, kind of, they just broke, chosen to break down the work a little bit differently. And so I guess that was the big surprise is that I have teams that are running very fast and I have teams that are running what looks to me like very slow, um, but they're both still getting the benefit of you know, the improved quality of decision making that leads to a smoother, a smoother path through the execution phases of innovation. Can you have uh, rapid learning cycles that maybe the first cycle is two weeks, but the second one is six weeks based on what you need to find out? Or is that just a matter of we've decided on two weeks, it works for us. It's two weeks and at two weeks we know, do we need to learn more or do we need to move on? Do you see what I'm asking? I'm, like, I'm really glad. Yes. Involved? And I'm really glad you asked that yeah. question because that was actually one of the learnings from Agile, which is that if you look at what's going on, um, almost all Agile uh, frameworks have a regular set cycle for development and they don't that doesn't change and what what happens is that people learn how to fit their work into whatever box you give them yeah. so if you give them a two-week box they're going to figure out how to get work done in a two-week box four-week box they'll, they'll figure out what a four you know what four weeks worth of work looks like and they'll get used to that and that will make them more efficient and um and the regular cadence of events that I know that I have to show up, you know, two weeks from now and I've got to have, and I've got to report on what I've learned, mm. pulls me to get that work done. It increases accountability for me to get that work done. Yeah. But that only works if it's regular. Because if it's not regular, then what can happen is I'm like, I'm not ready. Can we move this to another week? Can we just add another week to our learning cycle? And everybody's like, sure. Well, then there's no pull. You know, right. there's always going to be a reason to do that. And, and, but if you set a really hard um, line, and this is one of the few hard and fast rules of my framework is the events don't move. Once you set the events, they do not move. And that is, you know, is that it, you know, the, the purpose of the events, I, I tell people they're come as you are events. If you had the flu and you're, you're obviously you're going to show up and not marry, which has been done, but you need to adjust the plan based on what just happened. And the, the pro and the program team all needs to know this is what's going on with you. And so um, the regular cadence of events helps groups to figure out how to scale their work to fit in that box and then pulls the work through those boxes. And then when something does go wrong, it's visible to the team immediately. So that's interesting. So I, I was, I'm, spinning a little bit. So I'm like, oh, that makes, that makes a lot of sense, particularly about the accountability that, I mean, it's kind of like space and time, right? We, we fill what we have. <laughs> so on both sides. And, and it, I would assume, right, it's fair to say that, so let's say I'm in a two-week cycle or a six-week, doesn't even matter. I've, I've taken accountability for what I'm supposed to do. I've gone and figured something out. And that's added a new question that we now have to solve. That then goes into the second cycle. So it's not to say you suddenly just shut down right? I mean, you're learning all along the way, so I'm assuming it's compounding and everything builds on each other. 
Exactly, exactly. And if I, um, you know, and if I uncover that I've got a new knowledge gap in the middle of that cycle, um, say I've closed a knowledge gap, but in doing so I opened up another one, then I, I have to do is talk to my program leader and just let them know what I'm doing. Um, but then I can go ahead and go start working on closing that, that next, um, that next knowledge gap, you know, and then I'm just going to bring what I did to my, um, to my event and say, okay, here's what I did. You know, I got I closed this knowledge gap and I also started working on this one and get some feedback from the team about the direction that I'm going. And maybe um, you, find yeah, that you don't even need to dig there. Maybe it's not worth answering that question. Yeah, exactly. You know, I might do a day's worth of work of this and I'm like, ah, this isn't worth it. You know, and so it kind of gives me, you know, within the, um, we call that a time box and that's an agile term, by the way, that, like a time box it is like within that time box of two weeks, you know, I'm, I know what I'm working on. And I know kind of what the parameters are that I can play with within that, you know, which is I can reframe the question. I can do um, what I need to learn about that. If I open up another question, I can start working on it, you know, um, but at the end of that two weeks, I've got to bring everything back to my team and get feedback on it. Before we have to close out, I can't believe we're, we're over time, which is great. I mean, we're learning so much. Where can people yeah. go to learn more and connect with you? Okay, so the best place to go is highvelocityinnovation.com. Um, that is a place where you can um, you can get information about me, about my my work. There are links there to um, to places where you can learn more about rapid learning cycles. Um, so that that's by far the the best place to go to learn about me and my work. Awesome. So, what's your final piece of advice for innovators on Launch Street? Okay, final piece of advice for innovators. Um, Take a decision that you have coming up that kind of makes you a little nervous. Ask yourself what you need to know to make that decision with greater confidence and then see what you can do to go off and, and build that knowledge so that when you arrive at the time that you need to make that decision, you, you have a little bit more knowledge. Um, that's what's the core of what's happening with high velocity innovation. And if you can begin to get comfortable with doing that, um, that alone will help you. You know, I, I, I that's great advice. And it reminds me of, I used to have this boss that, you know, I'd go to them and say, this is the decision I'm thinking of making, but obviously hesitant for some reason. And they'd say, well, on a scale of one to 10, where are you? So I'd say six mm -hmm. or something. And they'd say, okay, well, what do you need to do to get to an eight? What do you need to know? Yes. And then I would yes. answer that. And the, what I loved about what my boss used to do is he wasn't saying, what do you need to have 100% certainty? Because that's never possible. But just to get you to an eight, because at eight, we can make the decision. What is it? And then mm -hmm. I would, he would send me off with those projects. It was absolutely brilliant. That, that is really good. Yes. Thank you for that. I'm going <laughs> yeah. to steal that. Oh, we should all use it because it's, I think from a leadership perspective too, it's, it gives the team permission to be um, hesitant and it helps mm -hmm. them figure out the path to get, not, like I said, not certainty, but a little bit of clarity in making the decision. And sometimes the decision, by the way, as you know, would end up being no, we're not doing it, uh -huh. but it was the decision I, I was having a hard, I was hesitant even making. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. There is so much richness in this interview. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I had a great time as well. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.